Research Group. And this is a talk in our speaker series. It should be settling down that we'll be having three or four speakers a semester. So this semester, the group really has been kind of getting gradually up and running, um, you know, over the course of it. Uh, for next semester, everything should be kind of more organized and kind of better planned through. Um, the idea with the social set of information here is that it's something that is inspired by the social studies of science, uh, otherwise known as science and technology studies. So one of the ideas that we're kind of inspired by with that is that it's a genuinely interdisciplinary kind of academic community. You know, there are people doing um, philosophy of science, kind of cultural studies and analysis, history of technology. Um, so you kind of have conferences and journals where these different kinds of perspectives are coming together um, with science or, or really science, technology, and medicine as the object of study. And by substituting science for information here, we have the idea that what we want to have is a kind of intellectual community in which those different kinds of perspectives and disciplinary backgrounds can be brought to bear on information as a common object. And we can have the same kind of um, exchange of ideas, um, which leads us to why we invited Jenna to be one of the speakers in our inaugural series. So I should say uh, I, I met her first uh, when I was a newly hired faculty person, um, which is now further ago than I, I, I would necessarily wish to admit, um, at the ACIST conferences. And ACIST for me, you know, it's the biggest kind of you know, information science conference. Um, for me, with a computer science and history of technology background, you know, I don't always feel kind of completely like I belong there, and I don't always, you know, find the culture and the people kind of entirely um, on my kind of same wavelength, uh, and generally stood out as being kind of very lively um, and very interested in these kind of basic questions around, like, information science, what is information science, what should information science be, and different kinds of research methods. So the thing that she, I think, is best known for within ACES is organizing a series of panels about meta-theoretical snowmen. And maybe you can just take a second to describe uh, the idea with those. Yes, right now. Yeah, sure. Why not? Uh, OK, uh, gosh, uh, there's a backstory to it. But uh, when I was a doctoral student, um, there was a contest to make a snowman in my department, an arts and crafts snowman. And uh, I thought that I would make my snowman bearing information. Uh, but for the snowman to be bearing information, I needed to know what theoretical position he was coming from. And I started to wonder about the different meta theories that snowman may embrace. And it led to the idea of representing different theories in information science in the reality of a snowman. And it kind of simplified and made accessible very difficult meta-theoretical issues and led to a series of panels where leading scholars of information science stand up and describe uh, an information science meta-theory such as cognitivism or social constructivism in the context of a snowman. And there's always a winner. There's five American <laughs> and they win the snowman trophy. And maybe someday Tom will represent uh, the historical meta-theory. Uh, yes. So, so <laughs> that kind of you know blending of you know this this interest in you know different you know theories and kind of these abstruse you know kind of airy things, and then that kind of reduction to practice and kind of liveliness and so on was was the kind of perspective that we really would like to have here is kind of thinking through these questions of you know what should the social centers of information be, how we can kind of produce this kind of environment in which these different you know theoretical perspectives and disciplinary backgrounds uh, can work. Well, um, so uh, I'm now going to give you three reasons why uh, why Jenna is the, is the ideal person uh, to be here presenting, and also you know for the smaller, more intimate. If you find this you know great crowd, you know too <laughs> too intimidating, we'll be having uh, the smaller, more intimate workshop at noon tomorrow, addressing the perennial question, you know, what is information? Um, it involves some kind of game where you draw things on pieces of cardboard. So it sounds good. Um, so the first is that, you know, as we've heard, on the one hand, she has a kind of what I think of as a STS kind of sensibility, you know, an interest in those kinds of, kind of questions of disciplinary uh, identities and norms and different ways of seeing the world and how, you know, how you can make these theories do something useful for you. But on the other hand, she's, she's that kind of unashamed and passionate defender of actual, you know, old school, like traditional LIS, you know, theory, which I, I you know, don't know anything about. 
but you know, it seems to me that that's exactly the kind of thing that we should be trying to do with this group. You know, we are, you know, even those of us who come with different disciplinary backgrounds outside traditional OIS, you know, we don't just want to kind of, you know, be the cool people who, you know, do theory or something, kind of look down on, you know, information retrieval. So, uh, you know, I see this kind of potential here for kind of saying, you know, how we can how we can align those things. Um, Jenna's PhD is from UCLA, which I know is kind of, you know. It, it seems to me it's kind of the most science and technology studies kind of oriented LIS school. And um, her BA is from Colby College in Maine, where I spent uh, two years, which is kind of small, liberal arts kind of college. Um, so uh, that, that was kind of something else that uh, brought us together at the beginning. Uh, so, you know, I think I asked her here to like describe, you know, this, this, this describing some research that comes out of her dissertation. But, you know, she's been kind of pursuing different ways. So not just to say, like, here's how these people use information, but to say, you know, if we have here what in some ways could be, you know, a study that someone in a sociology department would do, what is the extra that you get from conceptualizing it with these kind of information research methodologies instead of just seeing it straight sociology? Um, two, um, she's very smart. Um, she's puts a great deal of work into her presentations. Uh, I hope I'm not like building up too much here. And uh, here she is, you know, uh, a faculty from the University of Toronto, which is, you know, the best university in Canada. Although, you know, I'm probably offending people from the Canadian University. No, it's not Canadian, it's really but you know, it comes from the world, so I'll say that much. Um, and uh, then I, uh, as she's just mentioned, she also, if we run out of things to talk about in the discussion period. Um, she plays the marimba, which she doesn't have with her, and, but, but she does have some balloon animal making capabilities. Yeah. So we can always fill out the time with balloon animals. <laughs> <laughs> so Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Um, I'm excited. This is my first ever invited lecture uh, with an honorarium. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm very excited about your movement, the social study of information. I would like to be your northern outpost uh, up in Toronto, Canada. And I'm happy about it because I felt I'd never fit in to information studies and LIS proper on account of its specialty structure. I'm most associated with uh, information behavior. And I'm definitely interested in how people uh, act with information. But in my eyes, when they do that, they also engage classification systems. They bump right into them. And they also use information systems and practice retrieval. So I need to consider those areas, too. I've always felt straightjacketed in information behavior and rather would think orthogonally across the different specialties of uh, information studies to get a holistic understanding of information. I'm also hopeful about your movement because uh, I'm really jealous of sociology and anthropology, because they have such confidence in what they study. You know, sociologists study the social, and anthropologists study culture. But to say information studies, studies information. Well, first off, we don't even <laughs> say it that way. And also, it really seems more an artifact and doesn't capture the whole uh, of, of what we study. And I've always struggled in saying what I study and how I study it. And I've used words like, I study information phenomena, or I study informationality, or I study the information dimension of life. I'm kind of groping for these broader holistic terms. I haven't settled on one yet, but uh, maybe I'll get there. And I think that your community is thinking in the same way and looking for the same kind of uh, bigger conception. So um, I spent 10 years studying culinary information. Uh, that's my specific research area. And my dissertation was a study of information in the hobby of gourmet cooking. So I thought it would be novel to uh, formulate my thinking about the social study of information as a recipe. And this is what I gave to Tom as my abstract. Uh, and um, I realize now, as I put the talk together, that I bit off much more than I can chew. There's way too many big <laughs> ideas here. So we're going to move very quickly through the ingredients and spend most of our time on the technique, and then just end briefly on uh, 
on what it yields. But I'm going to take you through this idea in my talk and run about 35, 40 minutes. And I want to say that there's something for everyone. Uh, you will all get a souvenir. <laughs> and uh, there is a brief student interlude. Are there any students here? Okay, great. <laughs> Just for you guys, a student interlude to inspire you. And it's going to end with story time just as everybody's falling asleep, mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> so uh, those are some of the features. And now I will get underway. First, with the ingredients for the social study of information. Uh, I think that this area needs to tip its hat to sociology. And one way to do it is this idea of the sociological imagination. And it came from this uh, famous and notorious sociologist, C. Wright mm -hmm. Mills, mostly notorious for driving around the Columbia campus on his uh, motorcycle. But essentially, he uh, stated that we need to focus our analytical attention not on the individual and their biography, but on that individual and their biography in the context of history, the context of society, and in the context of culture. He was looking for a bigger explanation for the human experience. That notion has not been lost on the field of information studies, even though in the past 20 years we mostly have a cognitive bent where we think about what's happening in the mind. But you can trace back a social meta theory or a social approach all the way to the earliest days of information studies. Today, this idea, a social approach, goes by the name domain analysis or sometimes sociocognitivism and it's spearheaded by this Danish scholar, Birger Hjorland. But he proposes an approach to information studies in which knowledge formation and the development of knowledge structures take place within a socio-cultural context. So I've taken a socio-cognitive or a domain analytic approach in my own research on gourmet cooks. And essentially it holds that you don't look at individuals you look at communities, you look at collectives. And I was an avid gourmet cook all through my 20s. I collected hundreds of recipes, thousands of recipes, hundreds of cookbooks. And I always sensed there was something incredibly information rich about the culinary world. And so I went off to get my PhD, realized this had never been thought about or studied before, and had found right around that time this incredible uh, advertisement in Martha Stewart Living it shows a kitchen that is filled with cookbooks. And uh, I wondered, you know, does this really happen? Do people do this? Uh, and uh, so I designed a dissertation around the community, the collective of gourmet cooks, their whole social world, and wanted to understand the nature of information therein, and especially how it manifested in a, do a domestic uh, context. So my work is an example of this more socially oriented um, research in information studies. So this was the title. You can see that it tries to cut across just information behavior to look at resources and environments too. And I'm an ethnographer. I went out into the social world of gourmet cooking in Los Angeles and Boston. I hung out at farmers markets talking to people. I uh, volunteered in a culinary school. I went into 20 homes and I interviewed cooks I took photographs of their cookbook and recipe collections and their whole house, in fact. And then I diagrammed all of this um, on maps to see how these resources were located in the home and how they fit in the hobby and how it was all shaped in gourmet cooking. I'm going to use this uh, work as the backdrop for the rest of my talk. I wanted you to know a little bit uh, about it. So the third main ingredient would be a theory of the middle range. Uh, any theory will do. A theory of the middle range is an idea from a sociologist, A. Merton, which means not a grand sweeping sociological theory, not a tiny hypothesis, but something in the middle that characterizes a group so that research can be done more clearly uh, within that theory, that theory of the middle range. So these are theories that help to guide uh, inquiry. And there are billions of them out there. There are theories about sports, there are theories about medicine, and I propose that uh, the social study of information would be incomplete 
without some theory of the middle range from the setting where you're doing research, which is likely outside of the expertise of information studies. In my work, the theory of the middle range that I used under the banner of domain analysis came from the realm of leisure studies. I needed a way to account for the fact that this was a leisure activity and a hobby. And this is one of the best frameworks of what leisure is. Uh, and you can, it classifies leisure, and you can trace down from leisure into serious leisure and hobbies. And my study was a making and tinkering hobby. These are the craft hobbies of gourmet cooking. And this theory of the middle range brought in all of the background insight, social, cultural insight, about the social worlds that operate in hobbies, about the nature of resources and learning in hobbies. Uh, and I used it all uh, in my study. So I think those kinds of ideas need to form some kind of backdrop to the social study of information. But now, let's get into uh, the technique. This is a mentor of mine, uh, Marcia Bates, who in 1999 published uh, a wonderful article in the 50th anniversary issue of JSIST. And uh, it was a foundational statement of what information science is as a discipline and as a practice. And she called it the invisible substrate of information science. I want us to start with Bates's sense of what information science is. Because I still think this is at the heart of what we'll do. I appreciate that Tom introduced me in that way that we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater here. But Bates uh, looks at the university as having content <coughs> disciplines. The arts, sociology, biology, this isn't her illustration, I found this, but essentially they build towers of content knowledge. But there exists different kinds of disciplines that cut across them all. She uses the word orthogonal because they're fields that concern themselves with the dissemination of ideas in the other fields. Education, journalism, and information science. And often these disciplines are bundled in different schools. I came from a school of education and information studies. And she calls these the meta-disciplines. So education deals with teaching these other ideas through classrooms. Journalism deals with disseminating the content as news and information science deals with, uh, with collecting and providing access to the ideas in the other disciplines. She also says that being a meta-discipline gives us a special perspective on those, those other disciplines, and indeed on, on all of the world, because information science doesn't just apply to disciplines but to hobbies and to work. We have a special kind of uh, perspective. And uh, let's call it a meta-perspective, the meta-perspective of information science. And I think it really is a special way of looking at uh, the world. And she says that what we focus on in our special view is always the form and structure of information. Another way of saying that is we look for informational patterns. Indeed, that's what I was doing out in those homes of gourmet cooks. I was looking for informational patterns that were meaningful. Now, all that follows uh, is my creative extension of Bates's thinking. But I want us to practice different ways of viewing and looking. So everybody, please look at this image. And we can actually adjust what we see. I hope you can all see the man and the woman gazing at each other. See that? And you could also see the vase that forms the middle. And there's a third thing going on here too. Maybe you missed it, but their faces are two men, Mexican men, playing mariachi music. So there are different ways to see. And mind you, it's not just a, it's not just a function of your eyes but it's a function of your concentration and the way you focus your attention. Same thing here in this Escher-like plate. You can focus on the black demons or you can focus on the white angels and go back and forth. There are different ways of seeing. This one 
was trickier. I've never been able to get it. And I could leave you gazing at it for moments while I catch my breath. But there's some kind of pattern in there, folks. And if you were to stare at it long enough, I know it would come out. And it's in the blue. So there are subtle ways of seeing patterns within things. So this play of attention and looking, let's now apply it to academic disciplinary work and the idea of being the meta-discipline of information science. But first, regular people, when they look at an image like this, so here's an image of people cooking, they might see things like dinner time, chicken cacciatore, nice, desirable kitchen, uh, kind of everyday things, they might see that. And both their eyes and their concentration would move across those kinds of ideas. But looking at this from the perspective of other social sciences, different things come into focus. So sociologists, I suspect, would see a couple cooking, an upscale uh, couple cooking in a very nice kitchen. They might be wondering about divisions of labor and housework and they would certainly be looking at issues of uh, race and uh, gender and class in this. That is what they would see. Um, anthropologists would uh, probably focus on nutritional aspects here uh, and food production. This is something anthropologists are into. And whether these people uh, come from formerly hunter, gatherer, fisher, or agrarian <laughs> societies. I mean, these are the ideas and concepts of anthropologists. So what then is the meta perspective of information science as we gaze at this culinary site? And of course, I chose that picture because of its relevance to my research, because that's essentially what I was looking to see. What are the informational patterns in this activity of cooking? So what does information science see? If you could think about that for a moment. And uh, I'm going to take you through it. Well, uh, we would likely see terms and subjects. Our work is based on words. We love words. They're at the center of what we do. We would be mindful that there's probably a vocabulary in gourmet cooking that resides in some dictionary or thesaurus somewhere. And we love terms because we collect them into subjects, which are at the heart of information organization. We would also be mindful that somewhere in that cooking photograph, though you can't see it, are classification systems. Indeed, uh, cookbooks in libraries are classified here in the Library of Congress uh, classification system in the TXs in technology. Uh, right here in, uh, in cooking is where most of uh, the cookbooks will reside in the typical library. But these are the kinds of things that we pay attention to. Information science would also see genres and know that those people who are cooking probably have documents around them that take special forms in gourmet cooking. In here, those would be cookbooks. Uh, recipes are the kind of fundamental genre of gourmet cooking. Culinary magazines are popular, and menus are another special uh, genre in gourmet cooking. Genres accumulate into literatures, and that's what libraries are for. They need to house and hold literatures in both print and digital formats. Our field uh, is all about literatures, and clearly there are culinary literatures. Um, and we know how to analyze and count literatures in information science. And uh, students, the only um, original research method of information science is bibliometrics. It's the quantification of patterns within literatures that can result in beautiful maps like this that show topics and authors in relation to each other. Nothing like this exists for the culinary literature. I wish someone would turn their attention to that. I'm sure we could learn fascinating things. This is a bibliometric study of information science itself. But these are the kinds of things we see. To this point, I've been speaking mainly in print formats, but our meta perspective also considers uh, other formats and channels for information. This is the most popular website on gourmet cooking at the Curious, a great online database of recipes. 
There are many uh, television networks nowadays devoted to food and cooking, available 24 hours a day. And an information studies person would also know that the activity itself is a, a mode of uh, learning and, and a, a kind of information on its own. Our field is aware of what we call cognitive authority. This comes from Patrick Wilson, one of our most brilliant scholars, which basically is that the authors of books uh, establish expertise and credibility upon their publication. They become authorities on ideas through the publication process. Julia Child's um, uh, the French cooking one, the classic book on French cooking published in the late 50s, established her authority on French cooking. Emma Rue Lagasse, uh, a smaller figure, he's had less cognitive authority. I did this to scale. Mm -hmm. And she actually was 6'3. But um, <laughs> yeah, he's done a couple of cookbooks. But his cognitive authority comes more from his personality on television programs. And this is Ruth Reichel, the editor of the now defunct Gourmet magazine, who has a lot of cognitive authority. But an information science person, would know that there are experts in the field. Information science also sees information needs. In fact, this is our purpose in life. This is why we exist, is to meet information needs, such as this woman might be thinking, how do we know if this is done? And what follows is all kinds of information behaviors, like information sharing, uh, someone just speaking to her the answer, or she may go uh, looking for the answer on her own some way. I put information behavior in quotes because it's a contested term these days. Behavior is associated with behaviorism. And nowadays, this is more often called information practice to suggest that these things are done uh, in communities. Uh, but this is a whole research area of ours and one of my favorites. We're also mindful of information systems that store information and uh, the search ta tactics that people use, hundreds and thousands of studies have been done on the way people uh, search. And in this case, that woman might sit down and search for how do you cook chicken and figure out its doneness. Some people in our field are also uh, mindful of information policy, a whole research area that drenches all of the others, for it has implications for all of the other things I just mentioned. I say etc. because I brought to the fore what I think uh, are the, the major things that the field of information science and information studies sees, but there are others. We could go on and on probably brainstorming and listing some of uh, the things that, are, that we see with our special view. So uh, one can look at that cooking scene and focus in many ways. I think what I just went through is what you see when you focus on the form and structure uh, of information. All of those things form informational patterns. So when we look at this, to abstract it, because I think we're all good at abstracting things in information studies, something like this uh, appears. A constellation of, uh, of things. I group them all together. And these are our concerns. So, this exists in gourmet cooking. I've seen it up close and personal. But it also exists around any topic. Every academic discipline has its own constellation. Um, and not just academic disciplines, but every hobby has one as well. Every area of, uh, of work life has one. And so we can think of the world that we live in as being filled with these constellations of information forms. So I've replicated them here in different sizes. Unfortunately, I just cut and paste many from gourmet cooking. But naturally, each one would have its own set of people and unique genres. Uh, the hobby of marimba, for example, filled with sheet music and, and other kinds of experts. But I do believe they vary in size, because there are large literatures and there are smaller literatures as well. And I put all these in red. Because uh, Bates makes one very eloquent statement in her Invisible Substrate article. She says, we are always looking for the red thread of information in the social texture of people's lives. That is the charge of information science. And so you never, ever forget that. This is your souvenir. I made you these little cards to put in your <laughs> wallet and to carry home with you uh, and to meditate on. <laughs> I give these to my students and tell them, 
to take them out of the subway and hold them up against their forehead. <laughs> okay. So now for a special student interlude. May I have all of the students' attention? Maybe you've better thought not. Maybe you've not yet thought about your experience in information studies yet in this way. But it can be most inspiring and invigorating to be in a meta-discipline that cuts across all others. And it locates you in a unique place in the university and a unique place in society. You have this special x-ray vision that you can apply at will. Indeed, <laughs> it reminds me of the super friends. Now, you may be too young to appreciate them, but this was my favorite cartoon on Saturday mornings when I was growing up. This group of superheroes. And, you know, you had your regulars, like Superman, who represented strength, and Aquaman, who could control the oceans. And they were fantastic, but we have to point out their limitations. If your problem or your foe is not about strength or not about water, those guys are up the creek, okay? <laughs> they really can't help. But there are two special characters, Zan and Jaina, the Wonder Twins. And they have a magic power where they put their hands together and say, Wonder Twins' powers activate. And then they have the ability to become anything they want. And they always did really clever things like an ice crowbar and a gorilla. And so they would always <laughs> find some way to work together. And please note how they cut across uh, all of the other vertical uh, super friends. And so you guys, as information scientists, information scholars, whoever you want to view yourselves, you have this kind of flexible academic power or knowledge power in that, unlike the others, like the biologists, I mean, what are they going to do if they're in a skyscraper? Well, what can they, insight can they provide? What can, the, what can uh, well, I'm sure you get what I mean, that other content disciplines have limitations, but we really don't. And it can actually function as a, a type of superpower in your everyday lives, outside of your research and studies. And let me give you an example. Because it lets you talk to anybody about anything, and they think you're an expert, but you're not an expert in their content. You're an expert in the information constellation there, but they don't know that. So I was once at a picnic in the summer, and I met this guy who worked in mattresses. He was like the mattress king of Massachusetts. He owned a big mattress warehouse. <laughs> and he's telling me all about his, he's going to the, no, I don't remember what he was saying. But I asked him, are you going to the mattress conference? And do you read Mattress World? I, I totally <laughs> guessed about that. I, mean, I, had worked, I had worked in business libraries. And I knew every industry has Mattress World. It's World Magazine. And I was talking to him about the informational aspects of mattresses. And he said, how do you know so much about mattresses? I said, I don't. Uh, I just sleep on one. But he couldn't see the difference there. And I want you to know this, that most people don't uh, know what the red thread of information is uh, and don't know, well, they don't know how to discern it from the content area. So you can go on having all of these excellent conversations in your futures. So that was my little motivating part for students. <laughs> but there's one drawback about this. And it's that uh, you may understand what I just told you, but most people don't. They really don't get it. My, my grandmother still doesn't know what I do. I think she thinks I'm a medical doctor, in fact. Um, and uh, my parents still barely get it. I think they <coughs> think I work with computers. But uh, so this is a problem you face as individuals. And I have my students share funny stories of attempting to explain what an information studies degree does. Um, and uh, so this is a, a, a drawback that most people don't understand. And we face this problem as a field in that we don't represent ourselves well to the rest of the academy and to the public because it's so hard to explain uh, what I just explained. OK, so that's the special view of information science. And uh, it has yielded certain things over the decades. As pure information science, in a more kind of traditional Batesian sense, it's yielded superb information access. There are billions of publications, and most of the time, we can find them. But from a perspective of 
the social study of information, I think that this view can give more. It can yield more. And I'm going to call that tales of the field. And I'll explain it in a moment uh, after I say a few mo more words about information access. So all of the things that information science can see, I've just listed them here. Clearly, this is the infrastructure of libraries and information institutions. They couldn't run without them. Those very same concepts are, uh, they underlie pure information science and information retrieval. This is one of the classic, maybe the first model uh, for information retrieval that has on the one hand a document and on the other hand an information need. Not even a person, mind you. The person didn't come into the picture in the 1950s. Just an abstract need. And in information system and information retrieval, the whole purpose of it, major big studies of Trek databases, was to match the need in the document. And uh, the, those concepts that I took you through underlie all uh, of this. The terms, the classification system, the need, and so on. So the whole enterprise around information retrieval that uh, is everywhere today, and access is a product of this information science view. But I, I think that we can deliver more. More to uh, the university, our other social sciences, and more to uh, the general public as well. And again, I'm jealous of sociologists and I'm jealous of anthropologists. They know how to do this. They produce stories out of their work. Some of the earliest ethnographies were incredible stories of, of cultures that were, were new and discovered. And uh, so there's a long tradition of this storytelling in anthropology and sociology. And the phrase, tales of the field, has been around for about 20 years because of this sociologist wrote a methods book and called it Tales of the Field and described the different types of stories that sociologists can tell. They can be realist stories that really try to explain a new field site or a new community or culture or whatever. Or they can be confessional stories that are really more about the researcher and his experience of the culture. Or they can be impressionist stories that are practically performance arts, like plays, and there's all kinds of wild ways you can communicate this kind of research. Uh, so many researchers in sociology and anthropology will talk about producing tales of the field. In a contemporary example of this kind of writing is the book Sidewalk by sociologist Mitch Junior. He's an ethnographer. He spent months and months, maybe a couple of years, on the streets in Greenwich Village, hanging out with the book vendors, the people, sometimes homeless, who somehow collected books and sold them, hawked them, in a very outspoken way to passers-by. And uh, Junior ha has great transcripts of this experience, excellent field notes, and he made very, very good use of photography, which played a role in my research, too. So I'm inspired by Junior. And so, through the lens of sociology, this tale of the field is naturally all about um, uh, race and gender and class and urban problems of homelessness on the street and this kind of uh, marketplace that exists at the crossroads of all of those issues. It was a uh, <coughs> practically a bestseller. It's excerpts in the New Yorker, in the Atlantic. And from these kinds of tales of the field, social scientific ideas make their way out into the popular discourse. You know, ideas like Freudian slip, and midlife crisis, and urban sprawl that we all use in our vocabulary today come from research that's turned into story form and, and then gets disseminated. We've not been so good at that. Other methodologists have described how one writes tales of the field. Some of the most articulate people are three Californian sociologists named Emerson, Fritz, and Shaw. And they say that the researcher self-consciously makes his observations and experiences of particular local scenes speak 
to the concepts and traditions of a scholarly discipline. So what you see out in the field, you connect it to the concerns of your discipline. So the writer moves back and forth between specific events recounted in the field notes in more general concepts of interest to his discipline. That's what Dunier did. His street experiences were linked to the concerns of most sociologists. <laughs> when this is done, grandmothers can understand it. Other social scientists can pick it up too. So I'm going to tell some stories now of uh, my effort to do a little bit of this. I had asked, I wanted to get a comfy chair. <laughs> we should have rolled one in. This is just the tail end of my presentation now, so we're wrapping up. I'm going to tell you three tales of the field. Starting with Doreen's personal culinary library in Sherman Oaks, California. Don't worry, they're short stories. <laughs> uh, can we shut up? Did the lights pop? Great. Oh, that's perfect. Doreen, a 73-year-old homemaker from Los Angeles, California, is one of several million North Americans who practice the hobby of gourmet cooking. In her early 20s, she began to experiment with the exotic ingredients and advanced culinary techniques that mark this cooking style, and it quickly became a passion. She once prepared a Thai-themed feast for several friends serving more than a dozen homemade delicacies, such as stuffed chicken wings, pad thai, and pineapple ice cream. As a true hobbyist, Doreen has never worked in the food service industry. Instead, she cherishes gourmet cooking as a creative outlet and means to express affection for others, declaring her philosophy, when you cook for someone, you are sharing love. Fruit trees and potted herbs surround her ranch home belying the information center inside. Mm -hmm. Stepping into an open concept living and dining space, a visitor encounters a long wall of ceiling to floor shelves holding hundreds of cookbooks grouped by topic. Culinary magazines arrive in the mail monthly and are displayed on a coffee table, while past issues covering four <laughs> decades are in the garage in a clever reuse of laundry detergent boxes. <laughs> Her kitchen, renovated in the early 1980s, holds a cabinet-sized card file of several thousand handwritten recipes, including a, including a family favorite, lemon jello cake, which she baked for me. In a spare bedroom turned office, Doreen spends up to two hours a day on her computer, surfing food-themed websites, sorting folders and files of digital recipes, and staying current with hobby-related mailing lists and correspondence. On a regular basis, she calls these materials to identify promising recipes for her next cooking project. If the phone rings, it may be a friend with a cooking crisis that requires her expertise. Mm -hmm. This scenario, witnessed during ethnographic fieldwork in 2004, displays an elaborate home-based information environment cultivated by a non-professional in the context of a leisure pursuit. Such phenomena are not well documented in information research and invite the questions, is this typical? What are the features of such phenomena? How does it work? The end. My second story. Miracle at the Flying W Ranch. At the foot of Pike, Pike's Peak, in Colorado Springs, Colorado, is the Flying W Ranch, a working cattle ranch and tourist attraction. It is world famous for its vintage Western Main Street, delicious cowboy dinners, and musical act, the Flying W Wranglers. The founder and matriarch of the Flying W Ranch, Marion L. Wolf, was a passionate cook. According to daughter Terry Wolf, her mom cooked as a creative outlet set a beautiful table, and hosted wonderful holiday meals. Over a lifetime, Marion amassed a collection of more than 3,000 documentary items related to cooking. Many of these were obtained through cookbook of the month clubs, 
or purchased as a souvenir from travels. Terry says that her mother gathered cookbooks because she loved them as objects, not because they were necessarily used for cooking projects. Whereas some people read novels for pleasure, Terry reports that her mother religiously read her cookbooks. When Marion Wolfe passed away in 2001, her husband, Russ Wolfe, decided that the cookbook collection would be an interesting addition to the Flying W Ranch. The cookbooks could be perused by visitors, serve as a testament to Marion's creativity and spirit, and celebrate local cookery. To house the materials, a quaint single room structure was built in the style of an old-fashioned schoolhouse. It was called Marion's Cooking Library. Look closely at it. For the field of information studies, this is a real curiosity, a freestanding folk culinary <laughs> library generated throughout a lifetime by a single cook that is now open to the public in an amusement park. <laughs> <laughs> Marion's cooking library occupies about 350 square feet. It is geared for browsing and has no borrowing policy or catalog. A Flying W Ranch staff person welcomes visitors to the library and answers questions. There are several small writing desks with chairs that encourage visitors to sit down, browse through cookbooks, and copy recipes. The desks hold pencils and notepads that say a favorite recipe from Marion's Cooking Library. Mm -hmm. The collection is kept along one wall of 13 bookshelves with five or six shelves each. The first nine bookshelves contain individual cookbooks and some cookbook series. The last four bookcases hold culinary magazines. Interspersed throughout are published boxed recipe kits, each with hundreds of recipes. A primary organizing principle of the library today is genre. This is some of my field notes and my own analysis of the collection. Cookbooks, cookbook series, and box kits are separated from the culinary serials. A second organizing principle are about two dozen broad subject terms that establish groupings. Daughter Terry explained that during the sorting of the collection, these topics seemed obvious. No formal classification system was consulted. Marion had a unique process for recording and bringing attention to recipes that she already cooked and enjoyed. She placed a stick-up note on the cover of the text and listed the recipe in its page number. This way, she could more easily skim the front of the text to locate favorite recipes as compared to consulting the table of co content, index, or memory. This system functions as a novel, personal, selective, cover of the book index as compared to the standard back of the book index. She applied this technique to culinary serials too. Unbeknownst to Marion, her notes now serve as a recommender system or bibliography. <laughs> New users of the collection can easily access some of the favored recipes within the On June 24th of 2012, the Waldo Canyon forest fire spread throughout the Pikes Peak area and burned uncontrollable for several days and nights. My parents live in Colorado Springs and were evacuated. It was scary. Uh, the Flying W Ranch was destroyed Ooh. on June 26, 2012. Every structure on the property burned to the ground, with one exception, Marion's Cooking Library. Um, I've only learned of this because I have profiled this on my website. And right around the time of the fire, my website got a thousand hits, which is unprecedented, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow this story made the local news and the reporter linked to the profile on my website. Mm. And that's why I got the traffic. Uh, and I then did additional research to try to confirm this, uh, but I haven't done a lot of research. But indeed, it does seem to be the only structure standing. Uh, I, I think it's that right there. Mm. Um, but I suspect everything inside is ruined because even houses that didn't burn, everything inside melted. So. Mm. Okay. Um, my last one, I don't I haven't organized in narrative form like this. Thomas has heard me talk about this before. But I'm fascinated by the evolution of the recipe. Uh, look at this. This was a recipe from 
1952. Look how tiny it is. It only has three elements. Uh, it's got a title and ingredients list and briefly a method. Clearly people at this time knew how to cook because they say without a blink uh, to fill a plate with pie dough. So I guess someone knew how to make pie dough and how to make a lattice top. They also view food very simply because they simply say an apple, use, an, use apples, not Honeycrisp or Fuji or so on. <laughs> um, but look at recipes today. They sprawl. The structure has changed to a list. There's additional fields uh, included, uh, like the time, nutritional information, ratings from people, and uh, so I've been fascinated by the evolution of the recipe as a reflection of changing social and cultural uh, trends and practices. And I decided to do a study, I've never written it up, I hope to do it someday, where, uh, remember Doreen's collection of magazines in her garage, in the tie boxes? Well, she wanted to unload that. And I was eagerly doing my dissertation, so I said, I'll take it. So I lived at the time in like a 300 square foot guest house in Sherman Oaks, and I spent like a week <laughs> moving those magazines, and suddenly I was living in 50 years of, of magazines. But I thought, what a great collection to do research. So I went through that collection and found uh, apple pie recipes over this every 10 or 12 years, and I analyzed them for their features. Mm -hmm. So here are the recipes, all from gourmet. And here are the different fields that appear. Uh, a nutritional field popped up, a preparation time popped up, activity time. I also took measurements of the length and the number of paragraphs used. And you can see how fields appear uh, in time. And a deeper analysis of this linked with a sociological imagination could link these changes to nutritional trends, work trends where suddenly people are working so much that they want to know how much time it takes to cook an apple pie and so on. Uh, I have never written that up. But I think that's another sort of tale of the field, the tale of the recipe. So to conclude, uh, well this is my vision of the social study of information, drawing from these three kind of big ideas and, uh, and using the technique that we have of having a meta perspective but yielding not functional things like information access to libraries, but instead stories, uh, st stories uh, that we can tell to each other and to our grandmothers. So, thank you. <laughs>
and how are their impacts on how those mental models are created. Um, so uh, coming at, so the, the way that 4D fits in is the idea that we have um, specific histories uh, that sort of shape the way that we view the world um, in a sense of, you know, I guess, half um, that, that impacts our relation um, through practice. I'm looking for other entry points. Okay, so. good. And I'm not quick enough on my feet right now, nor an expert enough in that area to yeah. actually guide you into texts or scholars or anything like that. <laughs> you could find better sources for that. But I would just say, in general, you you uh, if you're taking a sociological approach, you have to engage those disciplines. I mean, I took three or four classes in sociology where I was up to my eyeballs in the hard ideas like ethnomethodology and symbolic act interactionism. Um, so uh, take the classes, hang out with sociologists, and read some of the bigger books. And there are some shortcuts. Right now, online, I'm taking two different introduction to sociology courses. There's incredible material online. Um, and so you can drop in to great lecturers that take you through the fundamentals of sociology. So uh, that you know those major theorists and how they fit into the scheme of things. Uh, I think it takes a significant investment. I mean, I, I really have, like, if I had three feet, like, two would be in information studies and one would probably be in sociology. A significant investment of time. I would say, don't be a dabbler in it. Good luck. And if you're around tomorrow, I would love to sit and hear more and maybe I can make some more specific recommendations. Because it just quickly, an observation I can make about your topic is Bourdieu and those big thinker sociologists are kind of one camp. I move in a different camp of sociologists, of the more empirical, ethnographic, uh, qualitative research. And so sociology is a big space, and you can't master it all. You're going to have to find the camp that's uh, most relevant to you and take the courses there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank Good you. luck. Thanks. Yes. Thank yeah. Actually, I could just say following up on that. What I did uh, my first year of graduate school coming from computer science to the history and sociology of science, I signed up for the introductory two semester uh, introduction to literary theory, which was mostly, you know, it was a required course for the conflict people. And, you know, they always sound so smart because they're always like, how does this relate to, you know, whoever's theory of whatever? I mean, you know, you think like, they, they've read everything, they know everything, and, you know, how can we compete? What I realized was, they basically know kind of one chapter or, you know, one famous article per great thinker. Yeah. And that was what was in, was in the reading pack. So, you know, yeah. like, like Cliffy gets, right? I mean, you know, he, he wrote a whole bunch of books in his amazing career, you know. Everybody is cogfight, you know. Just this kind of one little bit is what gets kind of pulled out there into the, the broader thing. So, you know, kind of something like that, maybe like a, a reader, you know, yeah. for a course like that would be a good thing to look at. So you can figure out first what kind of theories you find congenial. And second, you realize that most people are just bluffing from the greatest hits you know, <laughs> for all these things. You don't need to read everything that you know, Karl Marx or, or Popper or, you know, or anybody famous ever wrote because there's only this kind of tiny sliver of, of their work that makes it kind of into those kind of broad interdisciplinary kinds of conversations. Sure. There are no other questions. I think we can say one more thing to that. Yeah. Come on, Nadine, you look like you wanted to say something. But I, I just kind of more comment oriented first, and it's interesting because you know working with Nick too, and uh, I'm I'm in SD, I was a SDS communications major PhD at uh, California San Diego actually, and uh, it's really interesting. And one of the things that is I really enjoyed about this talk is because now I'm here, um, sort of leaping disciplines, and I've spent my first six months trying to figure out what info studies is, <laughs> um, and how one fits in. And it's interesting because I'm actually doing the reverse process of what you're talking about, right? Because I've gone from my domain field, and now I'm looking back and going, oh, there's all these different bits of things that I can see differently from the info field that I didn't see doing my PhD. And so that's actually been really interesting um, and thought-provoking. And, and, uh, like, for example, you know, I'm working on this thing to abstract to submit and just having this 
this theory that works um, using the internet imaginary and just going, wow, why didn't I know this as a grad student? Um, so it's actually been really fascinating. But the other comments I wanted to, to say too is I've been working on this intellectual property project around knitting and blogs. And it's, it's very, very interesting how also how sometimes the common everyday leads us into such interesting observations about our fields, which for this, this study is intellectual property, mm -hmm. which you wouldn't think, but the value of the everyday, I've learned, has been something. So I don't have a question yet, but yeah. that's my comment so far. So you are looking at knitting? Intellectual yeah, knitting? I've been, yes, because what's interesting, the, the one of the things I've started doing is looking at the bloggers. And yeah. the bloggers, the knitting and sewing bloggers, who their patterns are copyright, but their the products they make from them cannot be in most contexts. Okay. So, and what's interesting is I've been capturing um, blog posts about people's basically stealing. If you take the card um, copyright stance, stealing other people's work, yeah. um, and then con people write all these fantastic discourses about this uh, online. And what's really interesting about this, number one, is that they have no conception of how property, intellectual property law actually works, number one. But number two, they think they do. And they're making social norms based on how they think copyright law works, mm -hmm. which has been fantastic. And what's even more interesting about this is, of course, is that knitting was always a shared tradition. You taught each other to do it. People adapted projects. There was no understanding that anything was mine. And now you have people knitting selling patterns, they admit that they borrowed stitch patterns from the 1940s, but then they say, oh, and this is my property, and they'll they'll try to you know, sue people who use it, which I find fascinating. Um, so that's some of the stuff we've been working on now. Well, I'd like to stay in touch with you because um, I'm trying to organize people who are doing research under the banner of serious leisure. I mean, that's a hobby. These are hobbyists, yes. right? Yes. And there are several people. Yes. And so uh, we should stay in touch. I mean, I'd Absolutely. like to know how you kind of define that population. Mm -hmm. And there's um, other people in my air panel last year in Manchester had a couple of other people contribute their names. Yeah. Yeah, because that value. Yeah, and then Good moving, luck with that. <laughs> moving from their you know, hobby into some of them are actually trying to commercialize their hobby, which makes them even more angry when. Yeah. Still there, still. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. so. I have a question, probably a stupid question. So what can we get out of this storytelling? For example, I mean, I have a kind of interest in, I mean, I, I, I'm kind of fascinated with people uh, the, uh, making the, uh, the plastic model, the model of the, uh, mm -hmm. the, yeah. the airplane or the mm -hmm. tanks, you know, so detailed, so kind of skilled. They are normal, I mean, usual people doing something else in the daytime. Uh, and then the night or in the weekend, they spend a lot of time on doing that. So meticulous. But there are many, many people actually online. So then we can describe like uh, the Cooking, the, the meeting, or you know, uh, so the, the uh, one area, uh, each area. So, so I got, I had the uh, the qualitative research before, and also I did experiment actually, kind of kind of uh, qualitative mm -hmm. uh, experiment. So <coughs> I'm still wondering what should or what can we get out of those two uh, kind of opposite research method. So it, it, it makes sense, actually, like it said. It, it makes sense to more many people, uh, but still we got kind of criticism. So so what? You know, where, where, where is the variable? <laughs> so how can we, well, you know? OK. So what is the, the point of this? My answer is uh, a, a deeper, richer, understanding of the human experience. I mean, personally, I don't need any other answer than that. I mean, that's at the heart of scholarship, to understand the world around us, especially in some of the realms you're talking about, of blogging, where it's so new and so, you know, we, we, we 
just don't understand the dynamics there. So uh, let's take it back to uh, C. Wright Mills. And he valued that vision and that understanding. And there was another aspect of the sociological, magical, sociological imagination, was that it then informs the public and they become activists in these issues, okay? So that small personal experiences are linked to larger public, public problems that they can be understood and solved and engaged in an activist sense. So I don't actually need that as a part of my work, but that's a reason to do it is improve the world, maybe social justice in some instances, positive change. But much of the social sciences, I don't know. I think they're okay with doing things just to, 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 to understand humanity more. Mm -hmm. So another idea here is aesthetic description, right? Having yeah. that, that contextually rich understanding, my dissertation was ethnography too, yeah. um, having that contextually rich, thick description so that you can look into different communities and then see broader social norms and understandings across them. Yeah. But the, one of the things that's difficult is that unless a bunch of scholars do these things, it's hard to get that umbrella. Because um, ethnography takes so much time that it's hard to have that comparative work, I think. I was really, I'm just really encouraged by this whole thing. I came here because of the words domain and <laughs> I'm, I'm a first year PhD and I'm kind of being, uh, this doesn't leave this room, I'm kind of being forced to do <laughs> Not really, but, but uh, I, I was, like Wusuf said, I, you know, I'm very interested in all these different things, you know, this is just fascinating work to me, but I keep thinking, well, why am I doing this, why am I doing this, and this professor who shall remain unnamed is like, well, you know, we're going to, we're going to exhume this, this ontology that comes out of studying these people and the terminology that they use and everything, okay, ontology is a big word, I understand that, that goes with information science, that's going to be really cool. But uh, hearing what you're doing is just fascinating to me because I guess I'm just at this intersection of domain analysis, my qualitative class over in, in Urban Ed or something like that. And, and it, it, I, I, I guess, uh, will you just go out with me and have dinner? We talk about it. <laughs> Well, we, we do actually have a spot left for dinner. Oh, because it, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me. I have all these things, and everyone's telling me you have to be interested in what you're doing. You have to be interested in what you're going to be studying. You're going to be spending your the next five years working on this topic and everything. And I, I am new. I haven't found it yet. But I just found this whole thing very, very interesting that you can take something that, that is serious leisure. Really? Yes. I mean, it's so cool. Oh, yes. <laughs> as well in because I mean what you're really saying I mean that, that you're in the business uh, here of, of storytelling right you know of, of kind of getting immersed in the details of the particular and then you make a narrative about it you know it's got characters kind of it's got you know it's got some plot it's got kind of a development but like you say the problem is you know if you line up ten of these you know what do you do with them and you do I maybe need that kind of cultural shift in the same kind of way that you know you read a book of literature it's about you know very, very specific things that are made up and probably maybe happened a long time ago somewhere else. But it's kind of the nature of human life that you can see things in that situation, you know, if it's captured, you know, properly. Now, you might say, well, yeah, stories, you know, we don't, we don't want stories, we want, you know, proper scientific papers with research questions and hypotheses and, you know, methods and so on. But you know what? Those things are stories too. They're just very narrowly, highly stylized forms of storytelling that that, that follow an extremely generic kind of plot that, and have some weird storytelling conventions like where you can't use the word I and you know, <laughs> the researcher like has a brilliant thing that leads naturally to this and, All the and, are and which studies show, you know, I mean, <laughs> so, 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 some time ago uh, there was, I, I, I forget his name, but he was, uh, he was kind of, a, you know, an early kind of a, a real scientist and also someone who's kind of interested in you know the developing world of science studies and as an experiment tried writing a scientific paper that described what actually happened where you know they were researching something else and then they had kind of had this thing and then they tried something to work and then you know 
and it was completely unpublishable. <laughs> right. I mean, <laughs> you can only, in the scientific context, you have to kind of tell these stories that aren't how science even really happens. Mm. And, you know, but I'm mean, pulling back from the kind of science and technology studies viewpoint. You know, it's all stories. Mm. It's just some forms of research are more honest about that. That's, <laughs> that's what I would say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I would say actually everybody, you know, in my view, like all that PhD students should read um, maybe the first two chapters of Science in Action. Uh, but that's a... I actually have never published a Tales of the Field. Uh, I have published information behavior articles that have a very kind of cognitive quality to them, usually with a model involved. And uh, there are snippets of story in them, but I. So I, what I've actually shared with you is, is a vision of where I'd like to go. I'm not really there yet. Actually, yeah. So what is the appropriate vehicle for this then? Uh, and, and, and I don't mean to use the appropriate as an, in a normative phrase, but I mean like as, as scholars moving forward, if we integrate a, a, a much more, if we, if we take your advice and integrate a storytelling approach, um, and it would seem that that is a little bit, if we can't find homes for these that sort of accepted within the academy in terms of towards publishing in traditional journals, because it doesn't follow the traditional format, how do we, how do we sort of rework to emphasize this work? I think, we have different responses to that, I think in information studies it is time for a new I think we are really stuck right now. I, I don't know what you think of as journals, but JSYST, JDoc, Knowledge Organization, Information Processing and Management are just, there's something too rigid about all of them. And I know great scholars and thinkers who don't feel like they fit in those journals. So uh, maybe it's an opportunity for you guys, for your group, to have a journal. What do you think, Tom? Uh, well, you know, social studies and information just have a link to it, uh, it as, really a does. <laughs> as a journal type. I mean, we have these kind of two dimensions. We have the idea that, you know, we have the research group here. We also and, uh, have been kind of trying to, as you know, kind of kickstart this idea of, you know, community initially, an online community, mm -hmm. with that same kind of mission that would be much broader. And I said for that to work, you know, we'd, we'd have to come up with kind of more of a structure and also kind of step back a bit and, you know, let some kind of group of people based at different institutions. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it would make sense to me that there, there should be such a journal and, you know, mm -hmm. such a community. Um, when we have identified some probably fairly powerful collaborators with which use the data tools. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, now, well, first off, anyone who hasn't said anything, because I don't want to talk too much. Do we have any more questions from people who haven't said anything yet? I see. Katie's smiling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate your presentation, because it really kind of uh, made me think about my research and you know, how I relate to my research right now. Because I'm looking at you know how children think when they choose book, you know. When, so I'm kind of taking the qualitative research method. And so I just observe them, just let them play. I'm just you know really watching them and observe. So, but I mean when it comes to you know. The, how we really you know, uh, convey our research in a more you know, informal structure. I feel like the, because in academic area, journal usually considered more, you know, have more high impact than conference proceedings, I think. Mm -hmm. But when I go to conference and when I'm you know, in the presentation, there are so many people you know, give a great talk. They they are doing storytelling. Mm -hmm. Probably their conference proceeding may look different, you know, from what they are just did in the you know the, during the conference. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe the academic you know world should have you know changed their our perception about you know which vehicle is you know have more power to mm -hmm. convey the information. Yeah. 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 Okay, 
let, let me ask you about the meta disciplines thing then, because I like your, I think, I, you know, your superpowers and your extra vision. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's got that kind of upbeat confidence uh, that you know, maybe, maybe the discipline is needing. Um, at the same time, I would tell a different kind of story. So my story would be, uh, you know, if you look at the university and you've got two obvious, you know, kinds of, of, of departments and schools in it. So you've got the kind of traditional research disciplines in the sciences mm -hmm. and humanities that are coming from kind of communities of research practice who manage to institutionalize their discipline and have textbooks and an identity and um, funding and journals and, you know, eventually those kind of come entrenched enough areas of kind of knowledge practices that, you know, they get to have departments and PhD students in them. And then the other way is the kind of schools that grow from the idea that there is a social need for people who know how to do certain kinds of things, right? So, you know, uh, there's a need for teachers, doctors, nurses, lawyers, and those are the, the professional schools. And so in those areas, you know, it kind of comes from either way of, okay, we need people to teach those people to do it. And then they're like, but we're in a university, so we need to have some kind of theory that goes with that. And some kind of, and, and then it has to kind of try and you know develop this obviously area specific theory and kind of and in business people agonise all the time that business schools have kind of developed all this kind of quantitative theory that you know apes other disciplines and is completely irrelevant to business practitioners. Um, so you know I think that's maybe kind of tension that exists in all these you know professional school areas. So you know the ones you had there journalism. Information science and what was the other one? Education. Education. Education, right? So those are all in this kind of professional school model. And on the one hand, they have to be cross-cutting because you know, uh, they you know they're dealing with it now. Yeah. On the other hand, what I thought I thought that is like they're about you know making practitioners. And on the other hand, what you are talking about is the need that we really need to study practice. So maybe those kinds of ideas go together and you can make that kind of case that there's actually also an alignment there with the kind of traditional, professional kind of things of those schools, that they really should be concerned with integrating these different kinds of, of knowledge, you know, and that really this idea of observing practice and what people actually do, you know, more than kind of trying to make some highfalutin meta theory or, you know, some, some model with lots of boxes and arrows. You know, it's something that aligns with that because, you know, practice, studying it, practitioners, it, it kind of goes together. Are you asking me that? This is a comment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, on the one hand, you can say, you know, what we've got here is kind of bricolage driven by the needs of, of training practitioners, and we have to kind of grab a bit from here and a bit from here, and they need some of this and some of that, yeah. you know, which doesn't sound so highbrow. Yeah. Right, but then on the other hand, you know, as you've edged towards the study of practice, maybe maybe it makes more sense to try and integrate it on that level than on you know the kind of level of French theory or you know yeah. Marxism or some kind of you know all-encompassing kind of mega theory. Grand. Right. So some maybe those theory. those instincts that are drawing you to the middle ground and to kind of some more you know kind of more US kind of style sociology rather than, you know, continental theory or something is, is, is something that does actually make a lot of sense in this kind of professional disciplinary context. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but in the example of information studies, so Tom, I could see they could, we could turn our attention to practice. But isn't there something so big and important about it that begs, like, grand theory? That begs <laughs> having that kind of apparatus? You know, speaking as a historian, historians are very wary of grand theories. Anytime anyone, like, comes up with grand theory, we kind of get skeptical and, you know. So, we, we're in the storytelling business. So we like theories to the extent that it seems like they help us tell our stories better or better understand what's going on. But we kind of put the understanding and making the narrative coherent and powerful kind of center stage and we, we never try and have this idea that we're going to like solve some giant problem for the general case. Right. 
which is which is a difference. Um, Ideographic. But it seems like this drive to solve giant problems in theoretical ways for the general case is kind of what's what pushing things like information behavior in those directions that you maybe yes. don't like. But they get overly theoretical and arid, and, and that's kind of higher status than describing you know this person with these problems and the particulars. So maybe kind of the price of this, you know, bricolage kind of, you know, approach to assembling, like bits of theory and perspective that you know help you understand things better, is you have to accept that that's that's always going to be kind of specific. Like you know, you were saying yourself, right? You know, middle ground theory is to taste. You should kind of mm -hmm. find one that works for you, mm -hmm. and and it might not be the right one for somebody else. Isn't that the only way, I mean, from my perspective, isn't that kind of the way to do it? Because you can have grand, and I mean, I fought with this a lot in my, in my PhD program, right? It, I like criteria, it's wonderful to read, but does it account for what people are doing right on the ground? Which was always my question. Mm -hmm. But I get what you're saying, too, because my undergrad was history, right? It was, so it's sort of been all over the place. but. I always wanted to know, like, okay, does this make sense for the people who actually are using technology or actually employing these things, right? Which is then gets that gets back gets back to that middle ground. It's not as sexy as, as like you know, high critical theory, but then right. you actually see how the world is working from the bottom up and see what people are doing, which means <coughs> especially if you're interested in intervening in some way. Probably where you have to be, I would think. It reminds me of um, Leotard, that report for the Quebec Ministry of Yoga. Does it, it may not be as well known outside the Canada Okay, so it's Will and I who have this book. Anyway, so this guy, he was a French theorist, was gotten by the Quebec Ministry of Education to talk about education in the 90s. And he produced, produced a report that nobody can actually, it's called The Postmodern Condition. Yeah. And it's a book about, supposed to be about how to improve education in Quebec. And it's like everybody laughs at this world of ground because there's absolutely nothing in this report. They spent all this money getting this man, and the Quebec Board of Education could do nothing with it because there was no, there's no practical, there's nothing that they could grab and say, we need to X. Yeah. So isn't that why the middle? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you there. I mean, structuration, you know, Gibbons. I mean, that's kind of, you know, right. an attempt to solve in the general way this question, you know, yeah. the meta and the micro. Yeah, but I mean, it's, and I think that kind of stretches your mind. But well, again, as a historian, you know, I, I kind of think you, you really make progress when you kind of get into the specifics and try and. And try and make the story out of it instead of kind of staying and trying to solve everything on the plane of on the plane of theory. Um, but there's maybe a parallel here. You, you know, the same kind of problem in history. Everybody, you know, got got, got wary about meta narratives. You know, and and so the way to show that you've been smart, and at least until very recently for 20 years, was to say, you know, we think that we know such and such, but when we look closer and we dig in, we find that actually this community of people they. They resist this totalizing thing. You know, television, you know, did, did, did not impose values. Mass production was never as mass as we thought it was. Everything turns out to be specific and local and have, you know, agency in the people we didn't think had agency and so on. But then what do you do when you've undermined all the meta narratives and you know you've got everything is specific, you know? And that that's I think the same kind of issue, you know. So it's and I think historians are turning back to like grand kind of Epochs and yeah. and you know the history of humanity and so on. You know maybe maybe things go in those kinds of fashions. So uh, that that is certainly kind of the challenge that you're raising. You know mm -hmm. if we if we kind of dive in and, and and look at these kind of specific tales of you know centered on humans that kind of cross cut in mm -hmm. these areas. Is that the end in itself, or, or can it somehow zoom out again? You know informed yeah. by that. I, yeah. Anyway, I see. Uh, I see that our time is up. But you should, of course, have the last word as as I speak. No. Last word. It's just been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.
Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Great, and will not be visible. Your voice, however, may be captured if you ask a question. If you do not wish your voice to be captured, please speak to this is, um, in advance. So we can determine an alternative means for you to participate. Or feel free to write no, down a question and pass it to a staff member who can read it for you. 